Let us pray. Oh God, we ask that you open our hearts and minds with your very presence, with your very spirit. So as we consider your word, we may hear what, with joy what you would have us to hear this day. For we ask it in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> Tell you a story about Tilly. Tilly worked at a large corporation in downtown New York. In fact, she had worked there 35 years plus. It was her only job when her, she was a, a housewife, worked at the house. When her husband died, she went into this, into this business and began her em, only employment. Uh, and in those years, she had only missed 35 days. 35 days. And uh, she was only late one time in those 35 days of her work. And that's when her pipes froze in her very small apartment. Uh, now, you may think she was some high-profile executive, that she had a corner office and a plush carpet with a, with a bar in the corner, you know, and, and a bank of phones and, you know, a couple of computers on her desk, but no. Uh, she actually occupied the entire top floor of this corporation. She literally had all the offices on the top floor because she was the cleaning lady. She had all the desks, she had all the trash cans, she had all the closets uh, to take care of. Um, for most of her 30-some years, she had one boss. His name was J.T. Parker. And he was the business executive of the um, Central Broadcasting Service, CBS. And they met, you know, on a kind of a regular basis. They knew each other's name, and they said hello, and they said goodbye. And Parker, Parker did admire her loyalty and commitment to her job, although they didn't know each other very well at all. But he was impressed by how happy she seemed to be and how, how uh, um, amiable she was about her work. Sometimes it seemed to him that in this vast corporation, in this, in this huge uh, complex, she was the happiest person in the entire building. Of course, she actually earned the lowest wage of everyone in that building. Now, although Parker usually worked late, one Christmas Eve he worked extra late. And he realized that, you know, it was Christmas Eve, so he, he grabbed the rest of the papers on his desk and he shoved them into his briefcase and he slammed it closed and he headed for the door. And as he turned out his door to head down to the elevator, he heard Tilly behind him. And she's singing Christmas hymns. And he just stops. And he listens to her. One song after another. And he eventually just backed up against the wall and closed his eyes. And he drifted back to childhood in the Midwest, back to other Christmas Eves. He just went away for a little bit. And when he turned around, when he came to reality and he turned around, he saw Tilly there on the floor with a bucket and a brush and she's scrubbing diligently on the carpet trying to get a stain out some, someone with an overfilled coffee cup dribbled on the floor. The whole scene as she sang Silent Night just kind of overtook J.T. Parker. So he moved closer, got up right behind her, and apologetically he said, Tilly, and it kind of frightened her. And she turned and kind of leaned on one hip. Tilly, he said again, you've been working here almost as long as I have. You've done the same job year after year after year, and you've done it to perfection. You've never complained. And you've never asked for anything extra. How have you been able to do that? What is it about you that made that possible? Of course, Tilly stopped when Mr. Parker began to speak. 
and she pushed herself up on her arthritic knees with one arm, and she looked at Mr. Parker for a long moment, and she smiled at him and said, Well, Mr. Parker, for years, I cleaned and I scrubbed for Tilly. You know, to make a living. To be able to pay what I, uh, and buy what I needed. I was so unhappy. I was even mad. I was mad at myself, and I was mad at everybody else. I was mad on the inside, and I was mad on the outside. Then the Christ child, the Christmas baby, she says, came into my heart, came into my soul, and it made all the difference in the world to me. I learned to celebrate my Lord in everything I did, whether I was wiping, dusting, dumping, or scrubbing, raising my babies, or singing God's songs. I didn't do it for Tilly anymore. I did it for the Lord. And Mr. Parker just lost all expression. He became very nervous, as you can imagine. He became uncomfortable. He turned his face away and said, I'll see you in a few days, Tilly. I hope you have a Merry Christmas with your family. The same to you, Mr. Parker. And as Mr. Parker stepped on the elevator, he heard Tilly begin singing another song. Go tell it on the mountain. John, our favorite camel coat wearing bug eater, is on our plate again this morning. And he resembles an Old Testament prophet. He's a loner and he stands out there in the desert preaching, crying out to those in need. And those in need hear that cry and they start coming. They, they're desiring something and they think this crier out there in the wilderness has an idea of how to get it. Now we don't know a great deal about him except that he was born to two elderly parents who thought they were well beyond childbearing years and child raising years. We know that he's a, he's a cousin to Jesus, but that's about it. We just see him showing up out there in the wilderness. One minute he's out there in the wilderness preaching and teaching, another minute he's standing in the dirty, muddy water of the Jordan River. And his voice has passion, and it, its message confronts us. This is no, um, he, he doesn't uh, pet people, he doesn't uh, confirm them, he doesn't affirm them, he challenges them in his preaching. He confronts them. And even though the Christian church has not paid all that much attention to him, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that he was extremely popular and that he had attracted a lot of followers. The Gospels, in fact, treat him as a second stringer, almost as a backup quarterback. He almost seems accidental, if you will, to the cause and insignificant to the movement. His only obvious contribution is his baptism of his cousin Jesus. I think there's something mysterious about this baptizer. It's some, there's something mysterious about him that's intriguing. Our hearts, our minds just can't let him go. We can't surrender him. He captures our imagination. We can close our eyes and see him out there in the wilderness in that camel hair and that leather belt, crying out to humanity, preaching his heart out to everyone and to no one. He's preaching about something, someone, something, someone beyond himself to another that is greater than he. He preaches with courage as he challenges these broken souls and confronts the political and the powerful and the wealthy of his day. I have to admit, John fascinates me. His entire ministry 
takes place out there in the wilderness. He's not in the holy city of Jerusalem. He's not there with the, the politicians and the uh, political theologians of the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees. He's not engaged in the Sanhedrin, the governing body of Judaism. No, he's not there. He's out there in the desert. He's out there with people who have been shut out and cast away and put down, those who are worthless in society. In a way, I suppose, they are a spiritual wilderness. And John goes to the physical wilderness and cries out to them and for them. He heard their grunts and spiritual groans the grunts and spiritual groans of lost souls, and he became the lone beckoning voice out there in that wilderness. Now, the dictionary describes wilderness this way, that it's, that it's uncultured, that it's a wasteland, that it's empty, void, barren, and valueless. Now, what, they're, what the dictionary is describing is a physical geographical location. Now, you and I are more sophisticated than that. We know that wilderness is far beyond that. We know that there's much more to wilderness than a place. See, wilderness is not always out there, is it? Wilderness, more times than not, is right here. Right in our heart. Right in our soul. Biblical scholar Joachim Aramaeus said that this was the age of lost nerve. The Roman Empire ran the known world at that time. You know, it, it, it was their economy, it was their politics, it was their social uh, uh, structures that gave stability to Europe and the Middle East with its armies and its laws and its oppressive stability. And life was cheap. Life was cheap, almost worthless. There was a deep sense of futility, uh, of hopelessness and helplessness. helplessness. Life was a drudgery with no sense of meaning, no sense of purpose, and no sense of value. It was even worse for the poor. They were not only cast off from society, they were cast off from their religion as well. Their own religion didn't want them or accept them. So... They turned to magic and sorcery and astrology to give them some sense of worth and control. Now, again, there are many kinds of wildernesses. And they're not just geographical areas. But there's a wilderness for us all. For everyone, there's a wilderness. There's a wilderness for the poor, and there's a one for the rich. There's one for the oppressed, and there's one for the oppressor. There's one for the married, and there's one for the unmarried. There's one for the worker, the employed, one for the unemployed, underemployed, and the retired. There's one for the beautiful people. And there, there's one for those of us who are less than beautiful. And those wildernesses cry out, cry out for a voice. A voice that will acknowledge the void. Someone who will walk in the midst without fear and speak the gospel of compassion and grace and lift those souls from the quagmire of depravity and despair. We know the wilderness. We know it well. And we know exactly where it is. It's not out there. It's in here. But you know, Crying is never enough. Crying out in the wilderness is not enough. We can be brought to tears over many things. And tears are absolutely worthless unless, unless the crying leads to some kind of action. Talk is easy. Declarations are easy. Rules and new laws and regulations are easy. Diagnosis and prognosis and synthesis, all those things are easy if they don't lead us to some form of action. And it takes someone who's willing 
willing to go into the pain, the suffering, the loneliness, and the emptiness of the barren wasteland and offer themselves. John knew that, and he understood that. He heard the cry of these people, and he responded to it. He was there to give what he could, not holding back because he was not some, what's the word, um, uh, primo umo, the male prima donna. He did it anyway, being the second string quarterback. When I was a teenager, I was a bit of a loner. I know you don't, you can't imagine that. I know. Uh, well, not completely. I had a best friend. He was a golden retriever named Sam. And Sam went everywhere I went. And uh, if I had a sandwich, he got half of it. I mean, that's just the way it was. We were best buds. And the best pillow you ever had. Well, on the weekends, one of my favorite things was to go camping by myself with Sam. And I'd go way back in the woods behind our house. And, um, but I never felt lonely. And it was, it was more than just Sam being in my presence. Uh, my grandfather years earlier taught me that everything in the southeast, geographic, I mean, uh, uh, um, in terms of geography, uh, mountains, hills, and outcrops always go from the southeast to the north, uh, south, I mean, northeast to the southwest. Everything runs northeast, southwest. So in the daytime, all I had to do is look at a bump or an outcrop, and I knew exactly where north and south was in the daytime. But what do you do at night? What do you do at night when you can't see an outcrop, when you can't see a mountain or a hill? Well, you got to look at stars. And my dad taught me about pointer stars. Pointer stars will tell you where to go. They won't tell you how to get there, but they'll tell you which way to go. So at night, I could lie there, my head on Sam, look up at the sky, see the stars up through the loblolly pines, and I knew where, house, where the house was. I knew where home was. All I had to do was look at the pointer star. Life is like that. You know, the wilderness needs pointers. And it needs a voice out there crying in it to point us in the way. Now, there's been people throughout history that have pointed the way. You know, we had uh, Luther was the pointer star for the peasant Germans. We had Wesley, who was the pointer star for the, for the poor in England. We had uh, Bonhoeffer, who was the pointer star for the German people. Switzer was a pointer star for, the, for, uh, for those in, in uh, Central Africa. We've had pointers, and probably you have had a pointer in your life as well. Mine basically were, beyond my grandfather, my pointers were coaches. I had a lot of great coaches. They were pointer stars. And uh, when I messed up, they ran me till I just about passed out. They had, they had a solution to my merriment, you know, but they pointed me in the right direction. You may have had a neighbor, a friend, a parent, a teacher that was your pointer. And that's what happens. Once we get pointed in the right direction, guess our job is next to become pointers ourselves. We become pointers. We point others in the right direction. We not only hear the one crying in the wilderness, but we respond to those crying in the wilderness as well. Now, we kind of just left Tilly and Mr. Parker right there. And that's a nice story if we just left it there, but there's more to the story. She was a pointer star. She scrubbed until every spot was out of that carpet. She scrubbed until e Christmas Eve became Christmas morning. She sang songs and hummed songs. She whistled a few Christmas carols. And every now and again, she thought about Christmas past, about someone or something, and she would giggle to herself and then go back to scrubbing some more and singing some more. Around 2 a.m., she heard footsteps. And she thought it was one of the guards but the footsteps came right up behind her, and it was Mr. Parker. Tilly, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what you said. 
I make more in one day than you make in an entire year. I'm the darling of the business world. I have three homes and a dozen cars, and I can play golf on any course I desire in this world. I have a room filled with awards and citations and certificates. I have far too much power and and the prestige that goes with far too much power. But I am absolutely miserable. I am miserable. But you're happy. Does scrubbing that carpet, does scrubbing that carpet for your Lord make that much difference in your life? Until he could see the pain in this executive's face, he looked exhausted. She knew it was the kind of exhaustion that didn't come from work. It was the kind that comes from a steady diet of spiritual hopelessness and despair. Until he stood up and and she studied his face even further. And then she took his chin between her leathery, leathery fingers. And she looked him in the eye. And she said, it sure does, Mr. Parker. It sure does. Everyone needs something bigger than them. Something that gives life flavor. Something to remind you that you're more than what you do. More than what you have. And Tilly, do you think I could work for your Lord then? Till he paused for a second, she smiled. I sure do, Mr. Parker. I think the Lord would be happy to have you working for him. And right then, right there, that cleaning lady and this powerful executive knelt down beside a mop bucket and a scrub brush on a wet carpet. And they prayed for this Christ child to come into his heart. Now, that's a nice little story, but it doesn't end there either. Mr. Parker was transformed by this experience. It completely changed his life. It changed who he was. It literally changed what he was and how he was. And J.T. Parker began, and this is a, it's way back, it's a sexist title, but it was the Christian Businessmen's Association. He started that. Now it's the, uh, the, the Christian Persons Association. And it's still flourishing. Because he wanted the other executives on Madison Avenue to have the same kind of gift he got on that Christmas. He accepted the pointer star, Tilly, and then he became a pointer star for others. I wonder, what about us? Isn't it time for us to reclaim the meaning and the value and the purpose given us as children of God? Isn't it time for us to respond to that voice crying out there in the wilderness and then become pointers for all those who are out there crying in the wilderness as well? Isn't isn't it time for us to take on the mantle of being a pointer star to respond to the grunts and groans around us and point people in the way they desperately need. Someone is crying from the wilderness. How will we respond? How will we respond? Amen.